Hello. In this lecture, we'll discuss the uh, basis of the general design provisions for columns that are in the AISC specification. We'll build off of an earlier lecture where we derived the Euler buckling capacity of a column, the elastic buckling capacity, and we'll apply uh, practical considerations like residual stresses and initial out of straightnesses to come up with uh, design equations that are, that are put into use as opposed to the uh, academic limits that uh, are presented by crushing and Euler buckling. Let's get started. Columns are covered in Chapter E of the AISC specification. It's titled Compression Members, and it's made up of seven sections. It begins with a general section, and then a discussion of effective length, and then flexural buckling. The remaining sections are more advanced topics that we'll discuss uh, if we have enough time. The nominal compressive strength, P sub n, is the lowest value obtained based on the uh, limit states of flexural buckling, local buckling, torsional buckling, and flexural torsional buckling. The resistance factor that's used for all uh, compressive limit states is 0.9, and if you're unfortunate enough to be using allowable stress design, then you would use a factor of safety of 5 thirds. Okay, note that beam columns are also addressed in chapter H of the specification uh, under combined loads for beam columns, uh, where you have axial compression and flexure, and they're covered in chapter I for composites if you have concrete and steel uh, working together in compression. So the first thing you see in chapter E is a user note that is a large table. And uh, I like to refer to this as the roadmap, if you will, because it gives you the cross section uh, in the first column and then points you to the appropriate uh, provision specifications and lets you know which limit states you should check uh, based on uh, that cross section and whether or not your cross section has slender elements. Then that table is uh, rather large. So here's the second half of that table that addresses T sections, double angles, uh, single angles, and then uh, primitive geometric shapes. So one of the first things that we need to know is whether our cross section has slender elements or not. And this uh, indicates whether local buckling might be an issue for the particular section that we're evaluating. So these images here are from a textbook by Gaylord and Gaylord. It's an older textbook that uh, I use as a reference. And uh, uh, it shows a couple of images that are uh, showing local buckling of different elements. Now, I think that these were made out of aluminum as opposed to steel because aluminum has a modulus of elasticity that's about a third of that of steel. It buckles at a lower force, so it's easier to test aluminum sections for buckling, et cetera, et cetera. But anyways, over here on the left, you can see that we have a cross section that is basically an I shape or a W shape cross section. And you can see the rippling that occurs in the flanges of this section that indicate local buckling of that flange. Now over here on the right is a cruciform section. So if we look at that in section, it's basically just a cross, just a cross. And you can see the sweep in the flanges of that cross that uh, indicate that this cruciform has basically twisted there. So you could look at that in one of two ways. That could be a uh, local buckling mode for the flanges in the cruciform, or you could look at it as a torsional buckling mode of the cross section as a whole. And either way would be appropriate. Here's another image, uh, in this case from an Elsevier publication, and uh, this is a picture of a structure that I think may have been subjected to a fire. Uh, it does. They actually, the reference says elevated temperatures at the bottom. So you can see that the column here has actually failed in a local buckling mode. You can see the flange has some sweep there in the front side and then the back side, and then this flange has some uh, rippling there on uh, both sides. So um, when you get to an elevated temperature for steel, the modulus of elasticity drops down, and as E uh, decreases, then so does the buckling strength of the member. Now, we don't have an equation yet. Well, we don't have an equation to characterize local buckling, but it is a function of E, just like the Euler buckling strength uh, for flexural buckling of a column. So that's what flange local buckling looks like in practice. <laughs> 
Okay, this image, uh, again from an Elsevier uh, publication, shows uh, local buckling of the walls of tube sections. We do use tubes for columns uh, with some regularity. So you can see the, the wall faces have bulged out here and uh, crimpled in. Um, here's some bulging down here at the bottom of this and then some uh, crimpling here, but it looks like there might be some overall flexure in that member on the right. That's what local buckling in a tube type of member looks like. Okay, this was a uh, beam that was tested at Georgia Tech when I was there working on my PhD. And basically we were looking at the, uh, the beam to column connection over here at the right. So we have a T-stub uh, connecting the flange of the uh, column to the top flange of the beam, another T-stub connecting the flange of the column to the bottom flange of the beam. And what we did was uh, imposed a load on this beam by pushing up and down on the tip of it here with this actuator. Uh, to simulate the effects of an earthquake. But what that did was uh, when the actuator was pushing up, we ended up with compression on the top flange. And when the actuator was uh, pulling down, we ended up with compression on the bottom flange. So zooming in on the connection after the test, you can see that the compression that was uh, manifested in the top and the bottom flanges of the section resulted in local buckling uh, occurring in those flanges. So these are local buckling failure modes. And it's hard to see in this case because we're looking at the web uh, face on, but there is some uh, local buckling, some bulging that occurred in the web of this section as well. All right, let's take a look at an I-shaped section that's gonna be used as a column. Um, we're gonna focus on the web first and then we'll come back and talk about the flanges and the behavior is a little bit different. If we look at the web, uh, the web is going to be sub, uh, um, supported along two edges longitudinally. So the web is connected to the flanges along these two edges. So at those locations, it can't buckle in and out of the plane of the page. So if we isolate the web, then we can look at the, uh, the state of stress that's in the web. And it's going to be subjected to a state of compression like this on the top and on the bottom. So under a state of compression like that, the buckling mode shape that we might expect to see would be one where this uh, thing is buckling in and out of the plane of the web. So it might buckle out of the plane here like this and then buckle back in like that. So, okay, and it's hard for me to draw this, but luckily for everybody involved in this uh, little presentation, we have uh, this image here, which does a better job of illustrating that. So that would be web local buckling of, uh, of a section in compression. Now, um, when we look at this thing, this uh, web, we refer to it as a stiffened element. And the reason why is that it's supported along two different edges. Um, when we look at the flanges, uh, When we look at the flanges instead, flanges are supported only along one edge, so they're referred to as unstiffened elements. All right, so here's a, a, a cross-sectional view. We have uh, B over T uh, for the flange and B over T for the web. So like I said before, the web is a stiffened element because it's supported along two different uh, edges. So the web would be supported at this location here and this location here, so we refer to it as a stiffened element. With respect to the flanges though, the flanges has uh, um, <clears throat> one edge that's supported and the other edge that it's not. So if we look over here, the flange on this edge is supported, but this edge here is an unsupported edge. So we refer to that as an unstiffened element. Now the behavior is different because as you uh, remove that uh, edge constraint from one edge of the flange, it becomes more likely that that can buckle locally. So typically what you'll see in these members that are designed for compression is that the flanges with only one edge supported tend to be thicker than the webs where the webs have two edges supported. All right, so we're going to define values of lambda, which in general are B over T ratios. And the, the B and the T in this ratio are generic terms, where B is the breadth of some element and T is the thickness of that element. 
So if we look at the web specifically, the, the slenderness or lambda value, uh, B over T value for the web, is specifically going to be H over T sub W, as is illustrated there in the section on the left. So the height of that web, or H, is going to be the depth of the section minus two times the flange thickness divided by T sub W. <clears throat> then for the flanges, um, lambda is again a generic form value of B over T, but B in this case is half of the breadth of the flange, or half of B sub F, and the thickness is T sub F. So we end up with lambda for the flange equal to B sub F divided by two times T sub F. So if we refer to chapter B of the specification, it gives us uh, guidance on how to classify sections for local buckling. It says that for members subjected to axial compression, uh, they're classified as either non-slender element or slender element sections. So basically we have to look up a value of lambda sub r from table B4.1, and we compare the values of lambda that we had on the previous slide to these values of lambda r from the table. And if lambda, uh, for the element is less than lambda r, then we say that the element is non-slender. If lambda for the element is greater than lambda r from the table, then we say that this, the element is slender. So if we refer to the table here, you can see that it's broken down into two major sections. The first one is shown here for unstiffened elements like flanges or legs of angles or stems of t's and things of that nature. And primarily, we're going to be using the, uh, the first uh, one the most. So lambda r in this case is 0.56 times the square root of v e over f sub y. But we will use the other values occasionally too, depending on the particulars of the problem that we're solving. And then this is the second half of the table that shows uh, the limits lambda r for stiffened elements. So again, focusing on uh, the uh, web of an eye shape as a, a common example, lambda sub r for that case would be 1.49 times the square root of E divided by F sub y. So basically we calculate lambda for each of the elements in our cross section and we compare that value of lambda to the limiting value lambda r based on table B4.1. If lambda for the element is less than lambda r, then the element is non-slender. And if the element is, if lambda for the element is greater than lambda r, then the element is classified as slender. If it's non-slender, then we don't have to worry about local buckling. Local buckling might occur, but it'll occur at a load that is higher than the yield strength of the section. If uh, <clears throat> the element is slender, then local buckling might occur before the, the, uh, the member buckles in another mode or before it reaches yielding. All right, so the next thing to define is the effective length. And the effective length, uh, I refer to it typically as K times L, but the specification refers to it as L sub C instead. And that's a change in notation within the last couple of editions of the specification. So you'll hear me refer to the effective length as KL most often, but occasionally if I'm being consistent with the current edition of the specification, I'll refer to it as L sub C instead. So um, in order to calculate the effective length, we should refer to chapter C or appendix seven. There's a user note here that says that uh, KL over R or L sub C over R, the effective slenderness ratio should not exceed 200. And that basically would define an upper limit on the slenderness for a column. When you get a column with a slenderness greater than 200, that's just awfully slender. And you should probably consider using a different uh, cross section or shortening the member in some way. So chapter C and appendix seven can be uh, uh, very detailed um, and, and uh, are challenging to get our minds around. So for right now, we're just going to uh, give you the values of K, and then later on we'll come back and talk about how to determine the value of K in uh, 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 more specific cases. All right, so when we look at the design provision, section E3 uh, says that the nominal strength of a member in compression is equal to F critical times A sub G. So F critical is the critical stress. It's the stress on the section at the uh, uh, buckling load or at the, uh, the failure load of the column, and then A sub G is the gross area. If we have a situation where we have a rather short or stocky column, KL over R is less than or equal to 4.71 times the square root of E over F sub Y, then we use this first equation. 
uh, F critical 0.658 to the F sub Y over F sub E power times F sub Y. If we have a second case where KL over R is uh, a little larger, indicating we have a more slender column, then uh, we use a different equation for F sub critical. It's 0.877 times F sub E. <clears throat> now, the, uh, the check of whether or not KL over R qualifies for a short stocky column or a more slender column can also be made by comparing F sub Y to F sub E. If the ratio of F sub Y over F sub E is less than 2.25, then the first equation governs. Or if that ratio F sub Y over F sub E is greater than 2.25, then the second equation governs. <clears throat> what you'll find in practice is that in most cases, it's this first equation that tends to govern. This will govern more often than the second one. And we refer to that first case as uh, inelastic buckling and the second case as elastic buckling. So in those equations, F sub E is the oil or buckling stress or the elastic buckling stress. Um, it works out that E stands for either of those two. So F sub E is taken as pi squared E divided by the uh, uh, KL over R squared, the effective slenderness ratio squared. So if we look at how these equations uh, plot out on a solution space, we have the column slenderness uh, as the uh, independent parameter, KL over R on the x-axis, have the axial capacity of the column on the y-axis, P sub n. So as an upper limit on uh, column strength, the, the crushing load exists, and that's the product of F sub y and A sub g. In other words, reaching the yield stress and compression on the cross section. As the uh, slenderness increases, as we get a column that is uh, um, uh, longer or not as uh, large in cross-section, then elastic buckling comes in and becomes a limit state for us as well. And I'll call that, in this case, P sub E, which is the elastic buckling uh, load, or uh, which is equal to F sub E times A sub G. So that's the value that we derived in a previous lecture. So those two limit states, crushing load and the elastic buckling capacity, are both considered to be uh, academic or analytical limit states because they represent the uh, capacity of a perfect member. That's a, a column that's perfectly straight, has no initial stresses in it, that's loaded uh, with a load that's perfectly aligned, it doesn't uh, have any issues with end connections or anything like that. So um, um, those are academic limit states. In reality, we have limit states that uh, are uh, a bit more um, uh, conservative than that. Um, if we consider the fact that we have residual stresses, then for the shorter, stockier columns, we would introduce uh, a failure mode called inelastic buckling. And with inelastic buckling, we're not able to reach that upper peak, and uh, we uh, have a more rounded uh, um, failure uh, curve for that. In fact, we're able to reach the crushing load of the column only for a column that has a theoretical length of zero, which of course is not realistic. The transition between those two values, between the inelastic buckling and the elastic buckling, is uh, 4.71 times the square root of E over F sub Y, and this should be familiar to you from the equations that we presented earlier. So this is what the uh, um, uh, practical uh, column capacity would look like, accounting for the fact that we have residual stresses. If we include the effects of residual stresses and initial out of straightness, then you can see that the design curve actually drops further below the academic curves or the curve considering just residual stresses alone. So the idea of initial out of straightness is that you're never going to have a member coming out of a rolling mill that's perfectly straight. Um, how straight is it? Well, it's pretty straight, but it doesn't have to be too far out of straight in order to compromise the strength of the member in compression. So there are a number of different aspects that compromise the, uh, um, the strength of a member in compression. I think that the commentary to the AISC specification lists a total of nine things. Um, 
The two that impact it the most are residual stresses in the members and initial out of straightness. Now, residual stresses come from the way that the, the sections are manufactured. They're hot rolled, um, and in the case of a tube on the right, you can see that they're bent uh, into their final shape. So they end up with stresses in the section, even if there aren't any loads applied. So a beam is sitting on the truck delivered to a job site before it's even erected into the building and uh, subjected to any loads, it already has stresses in it. Now, why is that? Well, when these sections are rolled or manufactured, they uh, are done so at an elevated temperature, and then they are set out to where they cool down to uh, room temperature um, um, uh, in a cooling bed or some type of a location like that. Now, the, the cross sections don't cool uniformly. The sections that have more exposure to the air, if we look at the left, uh, the eye section on the left, for example, it would be the, the center of the web or the tips of the flanges. They have more surface area exposed and less mass. Those sections tend to cool the fastest. And as they cool, they tend to shrink and contract a little bit. But the, uh, the intersection between the uh, flanges and the web, the K-zone areas, for example, the areas shown in red here, cool more slowly because there are more, more mass in that area and there's less surface area exposed to the ambient temperature. So the tips of the flanges in the center of the web reach the room temperature first, but the other parts of the section are still hot and they continue to cool down and continue to contract. And as they do so, they put the tips of the flanges in the center of the web, the parts that cooled fastest, into a state of compression as the other parts tend to, to uh, finish cooling down. Those parts that cool more slowly end up in a state of pretension. Uh, and so this is a hard uh, idea to get your mind around, but uh, basically because parts of the cross section cool more slowly than others, they, uh, they tend to end up uh, in a, a state of, of pretension. The parts of the cross section that cool more quickly than the others tend to end up in a state of pre-compression. So you could end up with stresses in the cross section before the member is even loaded. So this shows the members uh, on a cooling bed, and uh, this process is uh, uh, one that uh, is used to roll just about every cross section. But even if you have a member built up out of plates uh, and welded together, the process of welding and then cooling afterwards also creates residual stresses in the member. Now there's a way of getting rid of these residual stresses. You could take these members, put them into an industrial oven, heat them up to their rolling temperature, and then cool them down over a period of days or hours. Um, but that process is very, very expensive because the ovens have to be very large in the order of 40 feet long in some cases. And it just doesn't make sense for us as engineers to specify that extra cost. It's easier for us to account for residual stresses in our design equation than it is to remove the residual stresses in the fabrication and erection process of steel buildings. So if we look at a, uh, uh, an I-shaped section, how big are the, uh, the residual stresses? Well, this is a figure out of Sam and Johnson and Mulhouse text, and it shows that uh, compressive residual stresses are on the order of 12 kips per square inch. Um, you can take that uh, value as uh, around 10 KSI for rolled sections or 16 and a half KSI for welded sections. And in older editions of the AISC specification, um, those values were actually called out, though nowadays they're built in and you don't necessarily see them uh, explicitly called out as an F sub R. But uh, it's unfortunate that the tips of the flanges end up in a state of pre-compression because when we go in now and put a load on this member, uh, so some type of a compression load up here, we tend to see the tips of the flanges out here where the, the residual stresses are the highest in compression tend to yield first. And it's those tips of the flanges that are furthest away from the neutral axis of the member that provide the most stability to the member. So when those uh, parts of the cross section reach their yield stress, then the modulus of elasticity drops to zero. And as the modulus of elasticity drops, then so does their contribution to the strength of the member in compression. So that's why residual stresses play such a big role in uh, in the uh, uh, difference between the analytical or academic strength curves of crushing and oil or buckling versus the design curves that we actually use in practice.
So um, since the, the level of residual stress is a function of cooling, which is a function of how thick the plates are and how much surface area is exposed and such, the uh, residual stresses can uh, be worse in members that are thicker and uh, um, more massive than in lighter members. So there used to be a table in older editions of the steel construction manual that would list uh, five different groups of shapes based on the relative thickness of the flanges and the webs. And depending on which group of shape you were working in, you might have to take extra precautions with respect to residual stresses. So group one shapes are those that tend to be fairly light, say a W14 by 22 to a 53, for example. A group three shape would be in the middle, so that'd be a 14, 145 to a 211, for example. And then the heavier groups would be, uh, the heavier shapes would be in group five. So a group five shape would, uh, uh, would be expected to have a, uh, a much worse set of residual stresses inside than a group one shape, for example. Now, we don't uh, call those out explicitly anymore, but uh, I think that it's good to, to have that in the back of your mind that when you deal with a heavier cross section, uh, thicker flanges, thicker web, etc., that residual stresses can play a larger role in the behavior of that member than they would for a lighter cross section. All right, now with respect to initial out of straightness, the members that come out of the rolling mill have both a camber and a sweep. So even if we're talking about a column where we wouldn't want any initial out of straightness, they're going to have some initial out of straightness to them. Now it's, uh, um, it's uh, challenging to, to quantify what these values are, but we have limits in the AISC specification. They're actually ASCE no, I'm sorry, ASTM limitations, but there's a, a table in chapter one of the AISC manual that gives these values. So there are limits to the, uh, the amount of camber and sweep that you can have, and those equations are given here, but those don't necessarily represent what the actual average value of camber and sweep are. So this slide gives a, an indication of what the, uh, the maximum values are for camber and sweep for initial out of straightness. Um, for a, a wide flange section, for example, ASTM A6 says that we can have a maximum deflection of L over 960, uh, and that would be the maximum initial out of straightness. But more typically, it's actually less than that. So L over 1500 is uh, what you would typically expect out of a steel mill nowadays. Uh, for a hollow structural section, the maximum sweep or camber is L over 500, roughly, but we would typically see something that's like L over 3,000 or L over 8,000. So we typically base our uh, specifications on an initial out of straightness of L over 6,300. Finally, for welded eye shapes, there isn't really a limitation that's in an ASTM specification, but we would typically see an initial out of straightness of L over 3,300. So these values of initial out of straightness aren't something that you need to account for explicitly. These are built into the design equations that we use in the AISC specification and uh, other specifications. And at the graduate level, we would actually go in and spend some time um, discussing how these initial out of straightnesses and how the residual stresses are actually accounted for in the equations that we use for design. But uh, for the sake of uh, purposes of this presentation, just keep in mind that uh, the initial uh, out of straightness and the residual stresses that are typically expected in members are already accounted for in the equations that you're going to use. All right, so um, it, it's worth mentioning that uh, there are provisions and other specifications that also cover um, uh, compression members, and it, this is one area where these provisions tend tend to change for whatever reason. At least it looks like they change. So if we go to the Ashto bridge specifications, um, the column provisions there are presented like this. If P sub E over P naught is greater than 0.44, then you have one design equation. And it looks familiar, right? 0.658 to the something over something power times something. And if P over P naught is less than 0.44, then you have a different equation. P sub N is equal to 0.877 times P naught. And here P naught is basically the crushing load of the column. If we have a cross section without slender elements where local buckling is not going to be a problem, then Q is equal to one in that equation. And then P sub E is the oil or buckling strength. Um, so um, these equations look familiar. In fact, 
In fact, if we do a little bit of mathematical manipulation, you could see that we could take the ratio of P sub E over P sub Y is the same as F sub E over F sub Y, and basically divide the gross area out, and that's equal to the inverse of F Y over F sub E. So then recognizing that 0.44 is basically just 1 over 2.25, then you can see that the, the requirement that P sub E over P sub Y be less than or greater than 0.44 is basically the same as requiring that F sub Y over F sub E is less than or greater than 2.25. So basically the current ASHTO provisions are mathematically the same as the provisions that are in the current AISC specification, AISC 360 2016 edition. If we look at older editions of the ASHTO specification, then they're presented differently. You see um, that when lambda is less than 2.25, then we have P sub n equal 0.66 to the lambda power times F sub y. And 0.66 is just a round off of 0.658, actually. If lambda is greater than 2.25, then P sub n is 0.88 times F sub y sub A sub g over lambda. And 0.88 is basically just 0.877 rounded up. And then lambda is a slenderness parameter, and it's uh, taken as KL over R times pi squared times F sub Y over E. So while that looks different, if we do some manipulation here, we can show that these provisions are basically the same that are in the current AISC specification as well. So lambda is a slenderness parameter, but if we do some substitution, we find out that the equations that are presented in the older ASHTO bridge specs are mathematically the same as what's in the current AISC specification. Finally, if we look at older AISC specifications, in this case going back to the 1999 edition of AISC, the provisions were presented differently, similar to the older ASHTO specifications, where F critical is equal to 0.658 to the lambda sub C squared power, or 0.877 divided by lambda sub C squ uh, squared, and then lambda sub C is a slenderness parameter, uh, and it's taken as KL divided by R pi times the square root of F sub Y over E. So that's basically the square root of the lambda value that's used in the older ASHTO specifications. But once again, if we do some mathematical manipulations, we could show that lambda sub C uh, is basically equal to the square uh, of the lambda value that's presented in the ASHTO specifications, show that the square root of 2.25 is one and a half. And so basically we could show that uh, older AISC specifications are also mathematically identical to the current AISC specification. Now, all of this is important because, uh, well, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, if you uh, uh, take a class on bridge engineering and look at some bridge design specifications, you might think that the column provisions are different for steel and bridges than they are in buildings. And that's not true. They're just presented differently. They're the, basically the same algebraically, but they just have a different presentations. Also, if you look through old calculations, maybe some, somebody wants you to review some calcs from the 1990s or early 2000s, and uh, you see the column uh, provisions look like they're different. They're actually the same, but they just are presented differently algebraically. Uh, more pragmatically for you guys, when you look through old exams and things like that that I'll post for you to study, then uh, it might look like the columns stuff has changed uh, dramatically, but it's really uh, the same uh, algebraically. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this lecture. And uh, after this, you should have a basic idea of how the, uh, um, the design provisions in the AISC specification uh, were derived, not necessarily uh, you know, from a quantitative point of view, but at least from a qualitative point of view. Um, this builds on the Euler buckling uh, modes that we derived in an earlier lecture and uh, applies uh, the idea of resist residual stresses and initial out of straight just to come up with practical design equations that uh, we're going to put into use for our calculations in the class. All right, thanks.